Welcome to the webinar on tomato varietal selection. This is the first webinar in a two-part series from the Tomato Organic Management and Improvement Project funded by NIFA OREI and led by Lori Hoagland of Purdue University. This is your host, Alice Formiga of the eOrganic Community of Practice at extension.org. You can find all eOrganic articles, videos, and recorded webinars on our website and on the eOrganic YouTube channel. This presentation will last about 45 minutes and then we'll have 30 minutes for questions. We'll be reading as many questions as we can after the presentation is over. So today I'm very pleased to welcome Lori Hoagland and Dan Eagle of Purdue University, Jim Myers of Oregon State University, Julie Dawson of the University of Wisconsin-Madison, along with Jared Zeistro and Lori McKenzie of the Organic Seed Alliance. They are going to be discussing various aspects of tomato breeding and selection, identifying key traits, choosing appropriate parents, making crosses, selecting for desirable traits, using genetic markers, and the process of saving seed. So with that, I'm going to turn things over to our first presenter, Lori Hoagland. Okay, great. Thank you, Alice. So, okay, as many of you are probably aware, um, demand for local and organic produce is rising across the country, um, but growers wanting to meet these markets um, can face challenges in terms of meeting consumer expectations for produce that might differ from fruit grown for supermarkets, and the challenges with uh, getting best management practices to grow those crops. Um, for example, tomatoes are a popular crop in local and organic food systems, and when we surveyed tomato growers to understand their needs, they overwhelmingly rated flavor as their top um, priority in those markets. And so a lot of growers are turning to heirloom varieties, which are often perceived to have um, superior flavor. The challenge, however, is that air, many heirloom varieties may not have um, the traits to be most productive in some of these organic and certain local types of cropping systems. For example, when we um, surveyed these tomato growers to identify their biggest production challenges, they mentioned disease management and specifically the foliar diseases of late blight, early blight, and septoria leaf spot, of which many heirloom varieties are not resistant to these pathogens that can be evolving over time. So there are some new resistant hybrid varieties available, but they may not have the flavor that um, growers are ex or consumers are expecting in local markets. And then there are also copper fungicides that can provide um, pretty good control of these diseases if they're applied in a timely manner, but um, excessive use can lead to soil and water quality problems. Um, so as a result of this, um, a large group of us um, interdisciplinary researchers from across the country came together in 2014 to establish the Tomato Organic Management and Improvement Project to address these challenges. And as Alice said, um, we received funding from the NIFA Organic Research and Extension Initiative to fund these studies. And we have three components um, that we're working for or working with on this project to try to address the issues that I just mentioned. And so one of those is focused on identifying biofungicides and biostimulants that can control these foliar diseases. And as Alice mentioned, we'll be talking more about that in a webinar scheduled at the end of the month on March 30th. Um, a second component of this project is we're investigating induced systemic resistance, which is an enhanced defensive state um, between beneficial microbes and plants, and so we're trying to understand um, how soil management practices and crop domestication can affect that relationship with the long-term goal of helping growers um, manage diseases in this way and integrate this into breeding projects. Um, so the final component that we're going to talk about today is a varietal development program where we're specifically focusing on trying to develop new varieties that have the flavor that growers or, and consumers are interested in and have resistance to the most problematic diseases in tomatoes. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Jim Myers to introduce um, how we're going about doing this breeding project. Okay, thank you very much, Lori. Um, we were, when we put this project together, we were faced with some um, issues with how do we uh, develop a methodology for evaluating uh, 
uh, material, uh, trialing and evaluating material, uh, particularly where our stakeholders are fresh market farms. Um, there's a challenge in screening resistant for resistant material on farm. Often farmers don't particularly want that um, uh, particular disease on farms. So, you know, it seemed like we needed a combination of both on station and on farm research. The other aspect of this is we were looking for um, broad app adaptation, and I think that's uh, where we came up with some of these diff uh, trialing in, in different areas. Um, let's see. So the the field trials, uh, as uh, Laurie mentioned, we have uh, four, lo four states where these, uh, six locations in four states where these trials have taken place. Um, the, um, you know, we have Pacific Northwest in Port Towns, Washington, and uh, Corvallis area, and then a couple in the Midwest with Julie Dawson and uh, Lori Hoagland at Purdue. And then in North Carolina, we have a, a, a mountain site with uh, Jeannie Davis managing that, and then Sanjin Gu doing the trials in the lowland areas in uh, North Carolina. Um, it's and we, I'll get into the the population structures and all that we've uh, been working with. We also have evaluated these for a number of traits, uh, both field traits and, and use traits, and then using winter greenhouse for recombination, and then marker assisted selection for to help with some of the, uh, the selection for disease, disease resistance. Um, the, um, basically, we were interested in combining disease resistance and flavor and quality. Uh, one uh, thing about tomatoes is, is it is a self-pollinated crop, and so it's a matter of, of crossing materials and then uh, selecting during subsequent generations of inbreeding. Um, one of the things we were looking for out of this was a an open pollinated type, not an uh, an F1 hybrid in particular. Um, and then using multiple environments for evaluation uh, and then marker assisted selection for uh, traits that are, uh, for which markers have been developed. Um, they, there are outfits that will screen these commercially and, and give you the results back. That's, that's basically the, the route that we've gone with this. The uh, the parents that we chose this uh, this project actually started clear back in 1984 with um, a collaboration between uh, John Navazio and Randy Gardner, a couple of the uh, a couple of breeding lines from the North Carolina State University program were used in this. These had resistance to early blight and late blue, late late blight, a, a good combination of genes with pH2 and pH3 for late blight resistance. Verticillium and resistance to Fusillium wealth race ones and two. These were in a determinate plant background, which is not what we were particularly interested in. The uh, parents, the providing the flavor and some of the, the heirloom traits were Wisconsin 55 and Crimson Sprinter. They're both indeterminate. They have excellent flavor. Uh, they might have some fruit quality issues like cracking and things like that. Um, when Wisconsin 55 has moderate early blight resistance and some degree of a kind of a polygenic late blight resistance. Crimson Sprinter has moderate septoria leaf spot resistance and it has the old gold crimson gene which gives it a, um, a higher level of lycopene and more intense pigment in the fruit. So as I mentioned, this was originally, the crosses originally were done by uh, John Navazio and, and Randy Gardner. And then this material uh, may have, it was advanced once or twice, but really sat on the shelf until um, Lori Hoagland picked this up and did some preliminary screening trials at, at Purdue in 2011 and 2012. And out of these, these these two populations were selected. These are these had the numbers OSA 811 and OSA 823, and they were in the F3 and the F2 generations. The um, this project did not get funded until the fall of 2014. So our first season in the field was 2015, 
and uh, we grew these families at locations across the U.S. on in, in these on storm st on station sites, and we um, were looking at a number of characters: uh, total fruit weight and f fruit number, marketable fruit number and fruit weight, and then bricks and flavor. We were doing sequential harvest across seasons, and and then um, evaluating for for disease over the season using area under the disease progress curve to rate the diseases. Um, different diseases were present. Early blight and powdery mildew were found in Indiana and, and North Carolina. Septorial leaf spot at Madison and, and in Wisconsin and Indiana and then verticillium here at, uh, in Oregon. Bacterial spec at Madison and then late blight in North Carolina and Oregon State University. Uh, we evaluated 23 families and then uh, selected 12 of those based on the results that we got out of these, these screen, the summer screening. Um, and we intercrossed these 12 families in the winter greenhouse 2015-16. And we also picked two lines directly out of this, the 422-1 and 404-1, which were uh, lines that seem to be pretty in pretty good shape and, and advance them directly. The um, in 2016, then we grew 16 families at the various field locations and evaluated them. Now, in the previous year, we had used a replicated trial design for evaluation, and we included uh, some checks like Brandywine and Iron Lady in those. Um, in 2016 because of limits to the amount of seed we had, we went to an augmented design, which um, basically the checks were, re checks were replicated, but then we had just single reps of the experimentals at the various locations. Um, and at the same time, we were doing a seed increase in, in uh, Port Townsend in, in Washington of this same set of families. The, uh, from the seed increase that was done in Washington, we selected a, um, a a set for further testing. These were grown out, and in the in, in Oregon, uh, in the the winter season. In fact, it's going on right now, as a matter of fact. But um, this material was screened for various molecular markers for verticillium, the two fusarium resistances, and the the two um, late blight resistance genes. And out of this, we selected 10 selections then for increase in, in the greenhouse. And that's currently where it stands. In the coming year, we, we will be uh, evaluating these materials on station and then going into regional organic farms as we select in, in future generations. So that um, is pretty much kind of a, a um, a summary of, of the progress to date on uh, and the methodology that we've used for trialing. Next, I want to just spend a little bit of time talking about making crosses. And um, I pictured here is Kara Young, who's a graduate student in my program, who's the one who's been doing a lot of these crosses. And she, um, and last year in particular, doing the recombination phase, that was a tremendous amount of work. And I'm very thankful that she was able to do that. Um, tomato flowers, as I mentioned earlier, it's a tomato is a self-pollinated crop. They have a perfect flower. In this image here, you see the, the petals, and the sepals are behind the petal. Then you have this uh, fused cone of anthers. There are five anthers that are, are united, and they surround uh, the ovary and then the style and the stigma. This particular flower shows the stigma protruding from the anther cone. This is more typical of the wild type of tomatoes and leads to a higher rate of outcrossing than in a uh, cultivated tomato. Often the cultivated tomato, the stigma is down within the anther cone, which uh, almost totally ensures that self-pollination will occur normally. So that's the flower structure we're working with. The uh, tools that we generally use for doing this are a um, pair of forceps for emasculating the flower, removing the anthers, uh, 
and then um, ethanol, uh, which is shown in this little vial here, which is used for sterilizing the forceps between pollinations, making sure you kill the pollen so that you don't get accidentally introduced pollen from the wrong parent. And then uh, tags for marking your crosses and then a pencil for writing. Now the other reason for a pencil here is that if the flowers are large enough, and it just depends on the variety, but sometimes you don't even need the forceps, a sharp pencil is all you need for doing the emasculation in tomatoes. So using those tools, um, you pick the flowers at uh, optimum stage for emasculation. This is prior to the flower opening. You want to catch it before the anthers have dehissed and allowed any of the pollen to escape. But if you try to emasculate it too small a flower, it can just be very difficult to work with and you mangle it and it's not likely that you'll get a useful cross out of that. So the optimum stage is just when it maybe is starting to show a little bit of color. Um, you, you open that flower up and then remove the, uh, the anthers. And this pictured here in this series, um, if, um, if you do it right, you can, rem you can break the anther cone loose from the, the rest of the flower and remove it as in one piece. Just slide it right up over the, the style and stigma as uh, Kara is doing in these sets of pictures here. Um, otherwise, if, if it doesn't come in one piece, then you have to kind of break it apart and remove each of the segments of the, the anther. Uh, once that's done, then you, you pick a, um, a flower from your, your pollen don donor that is open. Um, you want the anther to have dehissed, and in tomato, there are a set of slits on the inside of that anther cone on each anther from which the pollen is dispersed. And so you choose that, and then you apply that portion of the anther onto the, uh, the stigma of your emasculated flower. Now, um, some people will use, in particular if they're doing mass pollinations, they'll use a vibrator and catch the pollen and then use that. But when you're doing just individual crosses like this, we find this to be the most efficient way to proceed. And then here's uh, pollinating the, the, the flower. The, 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 the slit portion of the anther is being applied to the stigma here, and then after that's done, tagging the flower and writing the cross information the date and the um, the individual who did it, and that's the the process that we use. I think at this point I I uh, hand it off, hand it off to Jared. All right. Well, thank you, Jim. So I'm going to take over where Jim left off. After you make crosses, if you're working on a tomato breeding project, what is your next step? Well, the next step is going to be making selections out of those crosses, finding uh, plants that are closer to your ideal. And a big part of the trick of that is figuring out how to get the signal out of the noise. In other words, how to determine if the, the plants or the lines that you're selecting are genuinely better because of their in superior genetics versus just um, because of the influence of the particular environmental conditions they might be experiencing in your field. And how you do that is going to depend a little bit based on what generation out you are after your initial cross. Uh, I'm going to start by talking about selecting in the F2 generation. So this would be two generations after you made the cross. So the first generation after you made a cross would be your F1 generation. And in that generation, more or less, all the plants that you're looking at are going to be um, fairly uniform. They're going to uh, exist as sort of an intermediate between the two uh, parents that made the cross. And you're going to not be able to make a lot of selection out of that generation. But if you save seed from that F1 generation, that generation 1 removed from your initial cross, uh, Tomatoes are naturally self-pollinating crops, and so they will self-pollinate, and you will receive F2 seed to plant the next year when you save that seed. And in this F2 generation, what you will have is you will have 
a bunch of segregating plants. So each plant is going to appear to be a little bit different. You might have ones that look more like one of the parents in your cross. You might have ones that look a little bit like the other parent in your cross. You may have ones that look intermediate to the parents. <coughs> and you may have ones that are exhibit traits that are not really seen in either of the parents. And when you're um, selecting these, the challenge that you have is that you are dealing with individual plants. And so because of this, you have, you're, you'll be deciding, is this plant genetically superior? Do I want to be saving seed from it? And you're going to be trying to tease that out from, is this plant better performing, better looking, better tasting, just because of where it happens to be in the field, um, just because it happened to get a little bit more water or it was planted a little more deeply or shallowly or received more fertilizer or happens to be um, being infested by a pest more than the others just out of coincidence. So some of the tips for dealing with when you're selecting individual plants, also known as mass selection, some of the tips are first to consider in these early generations, uh, in this F2 generation, selecting highly heritable traits. So these would be traits that are predominantly affected by the genetics of the plant itself. Things like whether or not a plant is determinate versus indeterminate, uh, its fruit color, its fruit shape. Um, those are things that are fairly highly heritable as opposed to something like yield, for example, which is affected by genetics, but is also very much influenced by the particular environment that it's growing in. And it can be very hard to separate and distinguish <coughs> plants based on traits like yield when you're only able to look at a single plant at a time. So the second tip is, as much as possible, if you'd like to be growing a large population, meaning you'd like to be growing lots and lots of plants. And the reason for this is because especially if you're hoping to combine many desirable traits like flavor and yield and disease resistance and fruit appearance and the proper stature that you're interested in. If you're trying to combine all of those in a single plant or in a single line, ultimately, you're going to want to be able to look at many, many plants to be able to find ones that happen to have all the right combinations that you're looking for. And Ideally, you'd like to be selecting, ending up with many plants that all exhibit the traits that you like. This will give you room to continue to improve in subsequent generations. The third tip for dealing with mass selection in this F2 generation is to select as much as possible in a very uniform trial field. And I'll talk about that more on the next slide. And then the final tip is to select from quadrants, and I will talk about that in a subsequent slide. So when I'm referring to consistent field conditions, this is really important in any trial or breeding project that you're engaging in, but it's most important when you're dealing with this kind of single plant selection, this mass selection in the F2 generation, um, because what you want to be able to do is at the end of the day feel confident that the differences between the plants that you are selecting is as much as possible based on genetics and not based on the fact that the plants happen to be growing in the more fertile or better watered part of the field. And so when you're planning where your breeding trial is going to be, look, identify on your farm or in your garden locations where you can find a patch of ground that is as uniform as possible in terms of soil type, in terms of shade, in terms of fertility, uh, in terms of prior crops, um, in terms of irrigation and water availability, and then make sure throughout the season that you're treating that patch of ground, that trial, as uniformly as possible so that you're irrigating at the same time and in the same intensity across the entire patch, being careful not to let the edges get drier, for example, that you're cultivating uh, and weeding the whole patch at the same time. Likewise, fertilizing 
consistently, both in terms of how much is applied and when you do it, and harvesting and evaluating at the same time and in the same way. So finally, uh, the other tip for mass selection, for selecting single plants in a, a field of segregating F2 plants is to select evenly from sections of the field. What I mean by this is if you look at this diagram here, um, imagine that there is a gradient, say, of fertility or uh, soil texture so that the, it's the, the field is actually superior um, in terms of growing conditions in the upper right-hand corner and inferior in the lower left-hand corner. It's better, rather than saying if you were trying to pick your 20 best plants, it's better to, uh, instead of picking the 20 best plants from anywhere in the field, instead divide the field into four imaginary squares here and pick five from each square. This gives you a better chance to um, capture the best plants from the entire field. As you advance from the F2 generation to the F3 generation, that would mean the third generation after the cross and beyond, you have an opportunity to take advantage of a more powerful form of selection. This is family or progeny selection. So what this means is rather than evaluating individual plants on their own basis, you can now evaluate a whole related families of plants together in rows or plots. So how would you do this? The first step would be if in the F2 generation, if you are selecting plants to save seed from to advance your breeding project, rather than saving seeds uh, and bulking them all together, say that you save seeds from 20 plants, rather than taking all the seeds from all those plants and just putting it in one big bag, you would want to save seeds in individual separate bags. So if you save seed from 20 plants, you'd be saving 20 different bags of seed. And then you could take the next season, take seed from each of those bags and plant them in separate rows. These would be the, the family or progeny rows. And you can even plant them in replication, meaning you could plant each family in more than one place in the field. But this will give you much more power in being able to see if whether or not there are superior families because you can be looking at many plants at the same time and judging based on the overall quality of those related individuals. So for example, and this is of course extremely simplified here, ideally you'd be maybe growing uh, 20 or 50 or even 100 families or more, um, but say that you only had three families here. So each of these three rows uh, came from a seed that was saved from a separate plant uh, the previous year. And so each of these is uh, within each row is related because they shared the same um, uh, parent plant, the same mother and father in the case of tomatoes because they were self-pollinated the year before. So you'd look at them and you'd say, okay, which of these is the very best family overall? There may be a really nice plant individually in some of these uh, other rows, but you want to look and see, okay, are you know, 70, 80 percent of these plants all looking really pretty good? Um, in which case, those are the ones, those are the families that you would select. So in this case, you would maybe only be selecting the family on the left here, and then not saving seed from any of the plants in the other families. Even if there might be a good looking plant, if most of the other related plants in that row don't look good, then don't save seed from any of those. Then within that family, save, uh, look and find the very best plants in that family. And in turn, those would be the plants that you're now saving seed from. So here, you'd be selecting just uh, this family on the left, and then just these three plants are the ones that you'd be saving seed from. And if you'd like to continue this form of progeny or family selection, you would in turn save seed from those three plants in separate bags so that you would now have F4 families that you could be planting the next year. And so you can continue to do that and they'll become more and more uniform and easier and easier to distinguish. So that's uh, in a nutshell how you can do 
selection in your tomato breeding. I would encourage you at the end of this webinar, there will be some resources put up, including links to Organic Seed Alliance. We have a number of publications, including one on introduction to plant breeding and one on organic on-farm tomato breeding, both of which go into much more detail about this breeding process and how you can do it on your own farm. At this point, I'd like to turn it over to Dan, who's going to be talking about disease screening. So disease incidence is quantifying the number of diseased plants, and it's usually uh, given a as a proportion. So uh, forgive the watermelon example here, but um, you have two rows of watermelons here. Uh, the row on the left end, you can, you can probably see that there are two plants in the foreground here which are affected by this soil-borne disease, whereas the row on the right, uh, the, the plants all appear healthy. So if you had a row, for example, with 10 plants in it, and you chose two of those that were diseased, it's pretty easy to put a number on that and say that it's uh, 0.2 is your proportion of diseased plants for that particular variety. Now, later in the season, when these plants all grow together, it might be difficult uh, to take a disease incidence, and then you're left with taking a, a disease severity. Another example, then, would be if you had actually disease showing up on your, your fruit. Now, this is bacterial spot of tomato, and it would be possible to, to place, to call those fruit, to place in the unmarketable bin those fruit with, with bacterial spot or some other disease. So if you were doing that and you kept track of how many fruit were, were had the disease on it, then that would be a disease incidence. And it would be not, not too difficult to uh, place number on each plant. All right. And then uh, if you did that, it would be important to, to take that as a proportion of the total number of fruit and not the total fruit because the total fruit is going to vary uh, with the yield and that may uh, vary with cultivar. Now let's let's talk about disease severity. This is usually given as a percentage and this is just an estimate of the amount of disease. So how to measure disease severity? Well one way is just to, to, to give yourself a scale, a 1 to 5 or a 0 to 5 scale, uh, with 5 being the worst for example. Uh, what I would like to suggest here is that you actually put words with those numbers. So, for example, number one here is this is septoria leaf spot on, on a tomato plant, which usually shows up on the lower leaves first. Number one, then, might be lesions visible on lower leaves. Number two might be most lower leaves with lesions, et cetera, et cetera. And if you put numbers with those, then it makes it easier for you to go through and be consistent from plot to plot and from year to year on, on what numbers you give to, to what plants. Uh, in addition, let me suggest here that it's probably a good idea for one to go through, if possible, and give these uh, disease ratings because it can be uh, somewhat subjective. Okay, so in this case, we've given a, a, a number scale, a 0 to 5. It would also be possible to, to give uh, a, a 0 to 5 or 1 to 5 scale with percentages as seen here. So, for example, 1 is 1 to 20, 2 is 21 to 40 percent, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and as you see here, this, this disease, this is actually um, uh, early blight on, on tomato, and you would estimate how much percent uh, is there and then uh, just put it in the uh, category that you observe. I should mention here that 1 to 20, that would be anywhere from one lesion to, to 20 percent. And while I'm giving, uh, talking about disease severity and percent, let me put a, a, a plug in here for a scale that uh, pathologists commonly use, which is known as the uh, Horsfall Barrett measure of severity. And as you look at this uh, scale here, you'll notice that the, the categories, the percentages, get narrower uh, with less disease and with more disease. And the reason for that is because the human eye can more easily pick out these narrow percentages than it can with the higher percentages. So, for example, if I'm looking at a leaf with 1% and a, and, a, and a leaf with 5% disease, that's pretty easy for most people to pick out. However, 
um, give me a leaf with 30 percent and another one with 35 percent, that's harder for us to pick out. So this scale takes advantage of, uh, of that, uh, that fact. And it's different labs and different uh, people will uh, modify the scale to do in different ways, but this is uh, the basis for the horsefall Barrett scale. So let me give an example here. What we have here is a simulated leaf with simulated lesions on it. And uh, you look at the lesions, and then you kind of make up your mind how much percent disease you think is there. And then you would look down in the white, uh, the, the, the chart at the bottom, the and that match that, those numbers that are in your head now with the white there, and then you would go across to the gray area, and then you would pick out the Horsfall Barrett scale. What I try to do is in my mind's eye, move all the lesions on a leaf or all the dead leaves on a plant to one end or the other. Kind of in my mind's eye, imagine moving all those lesions to one end of the leaf then, and that's what we'll see next, okay? And move those lesions over, and in the next slide, I'm going to actually give the percentage of lesions on this leaf. So the lesions cover about 10.5 percent of that of that leaf. All right. So if you looked at 10.5 percent, you, you see that that fits in uh, with Horsfall Barrett scale three right here. Here's the six to 12. So 10.5 percent fits fits in there. You would give that a, a, a three. But if you had guessed anywhere from six to 12 percent, you would have uh, had the same number. Okay. And then I'll hand this over. I think Julia is the next one. Thanks. So I'm going to talk a little bit about screening for flavor. Uh, this is something that's obviously important to a lot of market growers for tomatoes. It was the top characteristic on Lori's survey and also on some of the surveys that we've done. Uh, it ranks up there with disease resistance and both have to be present often for growers to want to try a variety. So, uh, great little bit of delay there. So there are really two purposes to taste testing and either one or both can be the reason that you're doing taste testing. Uh, you can do taste testing to make selections among early generation breeding lines. And you can also do taste testing to develop a description of kind of an ideal variety or a particular variety that you might want to sell or describe to customers, whether that's in a seed catalog or um, market customers. So selection decision is you keep it or you drop it. Uh, description requires more detail on some of the components. Both of these can be done simply or can be done uh, in a more extensive way. I'm going to talk about some fairly simple and straightforward methods of using taste testing for selection uh, and description, but there's a lot of possibility here if you have more time or interest or people to do the taste testing. So for selection, uh, you really need to push things into two categories where it's either acceptable or not. You can take notes on why you want to keep or drop something. That's often very useful when you go back and you are trying to decide based on other characteristics whether this variety is something, this plant is something you really want to keep. If it has exceptional flavor and maybe not so strong of other traits, you might keep it for the flavor. If it just has acceptable flavor and not so great disease resistance, maybe you drop it. So it's a yes or no, but you also may want some information on why you would say keep it or drop it. Usually you're doing this at the beginning of a breeding process and so you need to go through many different uh, individual plants or uh, breeding lions. So you need a fairly rapid method of screening. Sometimes this is done in the field where you would taste in each plant. You could also do it where you lay out tomatoes from all the different breeding lines and go through as a crew. It's usually the breeding team that does this. That may be one person if it's a farmer doing the breeding, or it may be a crew of five or six if it is a, a more excessive breeding program. So usually this is a group of people that's going to be consistent over the season. You probably want to do the tasting in a relatively short time frame, so not comparing varieties that you taste in July to varieties that you taste in August, but kind of trying to do them all at once. Um, and you're trying to get an up or down decision. 
if you then want to move to more of a descriptive um, evaluation, there you're either trying to define breeding goals, so identifying the traits and the characteristics of flavor that are really important to preference. Uh, you might want to understand the relationship of sweetness or acidity to how people uh, perceive the variety, or you may want to be taking that description to a market. You usually can do fewer varieties in a descriptive kind of format. Uh, the gold standard for descriptive analysis is a trained panel, but that's not really something that's uh, realistic in a breeding situation in most cases. So you want to have a group of people that are going to be consistent across the season, maybe that have some experience with this. Uh, they're not necessarily going to have a lot of training, so you want to make the process as simple as possible. What we do uh, is try to avoid introducing bias into the screening, uh, but also make it possible for people to, to set it up quickly and for people to move through in a fairly rapid uh, manner. So we code the varieties because when we're tasting varieties that are actually varieties, uh, some of the names are more interesting than others, and that can influence how people perceive flavor. We also try to keep the codes relatively nondescript, so we use three letters, but uh, avoid things like the CIA or something that would be a recognizable acronym. Then we provide water and unsalted crackers. We try to have people taste the samples in different orders because the order of tasting can also influence how you uh, perceive flavor. And then we have a simple rating sheet where we're using a one to five scale for a number of different attributes. We use the list that's on the screen. Uh, that is still a bit too long, so we're trying to figure out which ones are highly correlated with each other so that we can eliminate some of the different characteristics that we're asking people to take. Usually we try to stick to around um, six to ten varieties, but that's often not enough to really get through a variety trial and taste enough to represent what we're growing in the field. So we're trying to simplify things so that we can also taste more varieties. Um, if you're working with a smaller number of varieties, you may be able to do a more extensive rating sheet. One of the things we're trying to do is uh, correlate different attributes to preference. And you have to be careful when you're asking people about preference because if you ask people about preference before they taste something and then ask them about some of the characteristics of that sample, they may change how they respond to it based on whether they like it or not. And so we always ask for preference at the end. It's not ideal. Ideally, we would do it in two different tastings, but like I said, what we want to accomplish is describing varieties in a breeding program. It's not necessarily going to be a sensory evaluation that will get published and follow all of the proper scientific protocols for sensory evaluation, but we want it to be as reliable and unbiased as possible. So we ask for preference afterwards. We are finding a strong correlation here between the uh, preference, the overall flavor rating, and the flavor intensity, and asking people about intensity induces less bias than asking them about preference. So we may move to just using that. Um, so I think that's pretty much uh, what I wanted to present about flavor evaluation. The main thing to do, remember is to keep it simple and try to reduce bias as much as possible so your tasting data is reliable. With that, I'll turn it over to Lori. Well, I'm going to run us through a quick visual process of um, how to save seed, which is actually pretty simple in tomato. Let's see, Alice. Oh, no, I am working. So the first thing you want to do, of course, is harvest seed from mature fruit. And if you, for some reason, need to get fruit out of the field or out of your greenhouse before it's entirely ripe, you can take um, somewhat immature seed or immature fruit, you definitely want it to have some amount of color and then let it um, sit out and color up. That's not ideal, but you will get some seed off of it if that's what you have to do. So the first step is to get the seed out of the fruit, and there's actually a lot of different ways to do this. 
you'll see in the upper left hand corner you can some people will sort of smash it on the screen and you can actually do a fairly large scale production that way and then you can um, use a hose to spray through any seed that's sticking up and the bottom right you see the blender and the peppers uh, peppers and tomatoes are done somewhat similarly and you can use a food processor if you do that we generally recommend you want to have somewhat dull blades on the processor you can wrap them in duct tape or um, something that sort of dulls them down so you're not breaking or scarifying your seeds in the top right you see just quartered pieces and that's what I have been doing because I've been we've been doing fairly small scale uh, seed collection with all the different breeding lines so I just quarter them and then I scoop out all of this nice uh, placental tissue in here and that's what you need to get rid of surrounding the seed that plant placental tissue has germination inhibitor compounds so you either need to break it down with fermentation or you need to get rid of it manually by um, rubbing and scrubbing so this is melons but this is an example of a sort of larger scale of just scooping out seeds into a bucket with your crew and then down here in the bottom this is actually a paint stirrer connected to a drill to help break up the pulp and the fiber and this is just another idea for sort of larger scale production we're going to skip that that's not a machine you actually use for tomatoes so I strongly recommend fermentation it is rather difficult to get rid of the pulp or the placental tissue manually and fermentation works fabulously well so um, Generally, you shouldn't need to add any water unless you've got um, a lot of pulp material. I find that if I just do the inner sort of placental tissue and seeds, I don't need to add water. But if I grind up the whole fruit, sometimes I will need to add a little bit of water. And you only want to add the most minimal amount of water to make a slurry. You don't want to add a lot of water because once that placental tissue breaks down you can if it sits there and it sits in the water for too long you can start having germination so you want to make that slurry keep it in a warm location ideally 70 to 85 degrees for about three to five days depending on how warm it is and you'll see sometimes you'll see this mold layer forming on the top that's okay you just want to stir that back in um, I generally stir mine once or twice a day and uh, you'll start to see the fermentation happening you'll see the bubbles you'll see the little bits of mold forming on the top so that was a large scale you can do in a big trash can this is what I've been doing for our uh, Tommy breeding lines I use a lot of mason jars um, quart jars and half gallon jars have been my favorite and it allows me to do multiple harvests on smaller amounts this is what your jar will look like once your fermentation is pretty much complete you'll see a lot of this separation and then you're going to decant, rinse and decant. So uh, is you're looking at peppers, but the idea is the same. This is that large scale. Once your fermentation is complete, you're going to um, fill up your vessel with water. And this is what your first pour is going to look like. You're going to pour off a lot of pulp and um, any uh, that placental tissue. And then you're just going to keep doing that and you're going to keep decanting until you get down to something like this that's pretty much pure seed and you see here he's pouring this into a sieve over a bucket to make sure he's not losing any of that seed here's a smaller scale version of that same thing um, these screens are very helpful if you end up with uh, not decanting off all of your pulp you can easily if your fermentation is complete you can easily wash this pulp through a screen using a hose and then you want to dry it I have found old window screens to be very helpful in drying things down again because we're doing lots of smaller lots of things you can see here I've got one big screen and this is actually three separate lots all separated out and then here on the bottom I have my tag for what each of those crosses are here's another picture of what that looks like in the greenhouse when we first started and these are even smaller lots so to give you an idea of scale uh, this works quite these concepts work well whether you're doing large scale or or much smaller scale and you'll notice this greenhouse has a nice shade cloth on it because um, heat can be very detrimental to especially naked seeds like this anything over 90 degrees can potentially kill your seed so if you are if you do have a really warm location and you're trying to dry things down in a um, 
a warm environment, make sure you have fans and airflow and make sure you're getting in there and uh, mixing up and turning the seed often to prevent any damage to the seed. And with that, I will point you to some additional resources. There's a great webinar by David Francis that you can access uh, on the uh, website right there. There are also several publications that we have done at the Organic Seed Alliance, including both general seed saving and some specific information on breeding tomatoes. And you can find that on the OSA website, which is here at seedalliance.org. And you just go to the Publications tab and it will ask you for some information. Every time you go to it and want to download it, we'll ask you um, for your email and your ID, and we don't do anything with that. It's just a way for us to track how many times our publications have been downloaded, which is very helpful when we are trying to get people um, and grants to give us more money to do more work like that. So um, thank you so much, and I'll turn it back over to Alice, and I think we have lots of time left for questions. Okay, thanks everyone. Um, we are going to have um, about 30 minutes for questions. All right, here's sort of a general question about selection. When we have a person selecting for what they think is the best example of a particular trait, how much do we lose in terms of the vigor of the plant? As humans, we don't know everything going on with the plant and we may be picking plants that are not really as good as we think they are. Well, this is Lori McKenzie and I'll just jump in with a general comment that you always want to select for a suite of traits and never narrow down, well, never say never. Uh, it can be dangerous and you are putting yourself at risk of losing other traits of value if your focus of selection becomes very narrow onto single traits or you know, one or two traits. So you always want to keep in mind um, other traits that are that are either what you're looking for or may contribute to a healthy plant. Okay, um, here's a question for Jim Myers. Um, he described the early generation selections and recombinations. Um, what is an example of the pedigree of the plants in the 16 to 17 greenhouse? Boy, an example of the pedigree, it's, it's a fairly complex um, cr crosses between the various families. Um, we didn't really go into detail on the numbering and all that. Um, I'm not sure I can provide the detail that um, the, the questioner wants there. Okay. Um, let's see. Here's a question about the practice of drying multiple varieties on one screen. If you do one per screen, you have little chance of a stray seed contaminating the purity of your batch. Um, why are you doing that? Is it a space problem? Yes. Yeah. It is a space okay. problem. Um, we have a, a fairly, uh, and since we had such large screens and small batches of the seed, it didn't really uh, make sense space-wise for us to use one screen. And we tried to separate everything as far, far apart from each other as possible. And if there was any question of where seeds came from between lots, we just threw those out. Um, okay. Uh, can I just? Sure. Real quick, just jump, jump in um, to regarding the, the pedigree question. Um, just yeah. as a quick example, so uh, first off, all the material, or well, almost all the material in the greenhouse right now, those are all F2 plants. Um, so you know the the crosses uh, were the second generation coming out of the crosses that were made in the greenhouse last year, and then uh, those are and then the those are F2s and. Uh, basically, their the, their F2 is coming out of the original uh, out of those crosses, which in turn were crosses of um, either uh, F3 families or F4 families or some um, back cross F3 families. Okay. Um, let's see. During the webinar, someone asked a number of questions, and we were typing back and forth here. And um, the last one was, what um, statistical software are you using? And are you using a linear model? And um, the answer to that one is, um, we've been using R, capital R, and the LME4 package for the linear mix model. So I hope that answers the question. Um, OK, another one. Do you start your search for breeding stock by searching through GRINs or other global seed banks? 
I'll take a stab at that question. Um, I have used Grin quite a bit in the past. Um, some of you may know that that uh, rich, developed some of the, the original Indigo tomatoes, and those all came out of the Grin system. Um, I think you you go to to mix sources though. I I wouldn't just go exclusively to Grin. Grin's a good place to go for disease resistance and unusual traits, but then you really need parents that are well adapted and. So then I think you're looking at heirlooms, you're looking at breeding lines out of other programs, you're looking at contemporary cultivars as, as parents too. Um, what diseases are you evaluating for? I know you mentioned early blight and late blight before. Um, is root knot nematode resistance or TMV resistance some of them? So uh, this is Dan Eagle. Uh, I guess what, what I thought is uh, you, I guess you're going to kind of evaluate whatever is there. Uh, certainly in a very sophisticated breeding program, you might introduce root knot or verticillium or whatever. Um, but, but I guess uh, what we're doing is evaluating uh, whatever comes in. Uh, so for us, uh, it's been early blight. It's been septoria. Uh, we've had a little verticillium. Uh, but we haven't uh, introduced anything in particular. Let's see. Here is a question. There are so many tomatoes in the world. What are the advantages of breeding over trialing promising heirlooms? Well, I'll take a, a run at that one too. The um, a lot of heirlooms out there don't have the the disease resistance package that we we really look for in contemporary tomatoes. You know, they have a lot of other very interesting traits, and the 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 questioner is right. They're just they're a huge number of of heirlooms and other varieties out there that um, you know I have by no means seen all the tomatoes in the world. Um, it's and it, I think though that there there's quite a bit of room for combining these traits, looking for parents that have um, unique sets of characters and then putting them together to to create things that will work well. In this case, you know, we're looking for things that work well in organic systems that have a good disease package and then have the market quality traits that uh, growers want. Okay, this might be a question for Jared and Lori. Um, what would be the first steps a large grower has to take in order to start growing its own seeds? Would they build greenhouses for this purpose or buy varieties to start crosses? What would you recommend? Um, I'll, 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 I'll start and then Lori can jump in. I think that it would okay. depend a lot on where you were at in the process. So if you already had a variety that you loved and it was something that didn't have uh, intellectual property restrictions on it that prevented you from saving seed and it was an open pollinated variety meaning that it, the seed would um, produce true to type uh, tomatoes well then you're really just at the point of uh, yeah, creating the infrastructure that allows you to save that seed. If you're in a uh, location where um, you know you can successfully produce tomatoes in the field, then you can probably simply produce uh, tomato seed in the field. Um, you'll need to be conscious of uh, certain uh, tomato diseases like tomato, you know, like tobacco mosaic virus, but um, you know, the steps to entry are a little easier then. Um, if you're not in a place where you already have a variety that you have identified and that you can save seed of, then probably the first step is really conducting variety trials. So looking and in, in trying to find what best varieties exist either as open pollinated varieties that you can easily save seed of or potentially as hybrids that you could initiate a breeding project with. Um, and if you don't find, and, you know, those variety trials may help you identify something that you can just run with and start saving seed of immediately or it may um, help you identify things that could potentially serve as parents uh, to make new crosses for. Okay. Um, oh, Lori, did you want to add to that? Or? You know, I think Jared covered it really okay. well, unless the questioner okay. has, no, that, has that was pretty something good. that we can Alice? cover. Yeah. Alice, may I add a bit to that? Of course. Um, I just wanted to 
to caution people about seaborne diseases. I think Jared touched on that with tomato mosaic virus, but that can be a particular problem with saving your own seed, and it depends on where you're growing and what sort of pathogens you might have around. And things like bacterial speck and bacterial spot can be seed transmitted. Tomato mosaic virus is one that will uh, will uh, colonize the outside of the seed coat or be deposited on the outside of the seed coat. And um, and then there there are now some um, uh, pospaviroids and other rather exotic things that people are having some trouble with uh, other viruses that um, might be, be particular problems. So I would caution people to start with good quality seed that doesn't have these problems and try to grow them in environments where you aren't going to have these diseases be present. There are also things in cleaning the seed that you can do that will eliminate some of these pathogens. If they're not in the interior of seed, if they're on the exterior, then these various processes will help you eliminate the, the pathogens. But um, the, unfortunately, I don't know of any that are certified organic approaches. Uh, these are things like hydrochloric acid uh, treatment of the seed to clean them up. Fermentation, by the way, does help to some degree, but not as effective as something like the, the hydrochloric acid treatment. Yeah, that was actually the next question, Tim, um, how you are controlling for seedborne disease. So does anybody else have any other um, practices that they're using to control seedborne disease? Um, well, go ahead, Jim, but I, I, one thing I was going to add is uh, I don't know how you feel about uh, heat treating seeds, Jim. Um, yeah, I think that would be a, something very interesting. Now, I don't know that that's been worked out on tomato seed. I'm not aware of research on that for tomatoes specifically. But, uh, Ohio State has a, a bulletin about that, I think. Okay. Um, the other site, particularly if you want to know about the hydrochloric acid treatment of tomato seed, AVRDC, the, the World Vegetable Center, has um, some publications on saving tomato seed, and they describe the technique there in that bulletin. Okay, um, let's see. What year do you expect the lines to be essentially uniform for commercialization? So we have... Uh, one line that we're happy with right now um, that had been uh, Jim had mentioned, and I think we're let's see we're at F let's see two more generations we're at F six on that now. Um, so that at this point is going to be fairly stable, and you know, it's already being sent out for 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 testing with an eye towards commercialization. You know the other material that we have that resulted from those crosses in last winter's greenhouse, we're going to have F3 families. So those are going to be still segregating um, if we, you know, if we um, continue to you know, self-pollinate and advance them both this coming summer and then you know, next uh, winter, you know, then they'll advance two more generations to F5 and uh, you know, we'll at least be uh, at the point of, you know, getting close to stability. One of the things that we've been exploring at Organic Seed Alliance is kind of this question of how uniform is uniform enough for commercialization and looking at with an eye towards you know, releasing material that still has some diversity in it uh, as an opportunity for farmers to continue to select out of. So I, I could see us potentially releasing these in a slightly earlier generation than you might see typically released from a, a breeding program. Okay, um, be because the flower parts are so small, do you have any special techniques for crossing cherry tomatoes? For example, get better glasses. Yes, um, you know, we, we work with a number of different species and, and basically I would say tomatoes are one of the easiest that we we work with, but uh, the the questioner is correct that the cherry tomatoes can be very difficult, and particularly current tomatoes with, with very small flower parts. 
we have a you know these the jeweler's headsets with the magnifying glasses are the best way I think to be able to do that sort of work that and then just lots of practice with the crossing uh, you eventually reach a point where you could could do it just about in your sleep and um, <laughs> that's that's what we found works best okay um, this one is probably for Julie. How do you remove bias when you're dealing with colors or stripes um, in taste testing? Good question. Um, so what we do is um, consider that that appearance is part of the, um, is one of the factors that someone would use in buying a tomato and so we don't try to take it out of our taste tests. There are methods of doing that, and that would be to taste it under red light so that you couldn't distinguish between yellow, orange, and red. The one thing we do is cut the tomatoes up so that the size uh, or appearance, whether it's cracked or it looks like an heirloom or not, doesn't influence the taste testing, but we don't try to collect correct for color we ask for it as a score and we try to by asking about appearance and color give people a place to put that feedback so that they can consider the other ones separately it doesn't completely remove it but like I said we're dealing with a situation where that is something that consumers will look at when they're picking a tomato so we just incorporate it into the into the selection process. For the tomatoes in the Tomi project, the appearance is fairly similar from one line to the next. For some of the other work we do, we have a range of colors, but for the ones that we're selecting, particularly for this project, um, they're fairly uniform in uh, color. Okay, this one might be for Dan um, or anyone who wants to take it. Um, can you recommend any information on how to measure disease severity? I know our archive has some great um, tomato disease webinar presentations on late blight and early blight um, by Meg McGrath out of Cornell, but do you have any other recommendations on how to measure the severity of diseases? Uh, and, and I guess uh, I, I have shared some things with the, the group here. Um, I, I suppose it would be possible to make that those things available, um, but, but if you're talking about additional resources, I, I guess I'd have to think about that a little bit. Okay. Um, let's see. How economical is using molecular marker as I'm not sure how to pronounce this, ASEANS. Um, it's probably the wrong way to pronounce it, but um, let's see, at what scale does it make sense to consider? So I could I could say more or less how much it, it cost us. Um, I believe that the price we paid for screening for those five markers that Jim mentioned and we um, screened um, a, approximately um, let's see, it was, I don't know, <laughs> now I need to look at my, my, my spreadsheet, but I think we screened, let's see, it was um, about 500 plants for those five, no, oh, close to 1,000 plants for those five markers, and that cost us, I think, um, and uh, if anyone wants to jump in with the right numbers, but I believe it cost us around um, $1,500 for that, so... Um, it, you know, it, it was uh, it's, so. So part of it is that it's charged by by the plate. Um, so you know, you're looking at you know, uh, it's kind of in these increments of 92, um, which is how many um, you know cell wells there are in, on a on a plate that gets analyzed. So you know, once you get you know, once you have multiple uh, multiples of 92, um, it gets more economical. It's also again just a comparison between you know what you're trying to accomplish and then um, you know the cost of actually thinking about what it costs you to plant those tomatoes in a field and evaluate them in a field and and also you know for us the opportunity to to do something in in the winter um, you know during the this greenhouse advancement that was already taking place. I would I would uh, put a big caveat in all of this, which is that you know, the marker technology is not necessarily 
100% reliable, and so you don't want to lean, you know, you don't want to use it solely as the basis for your selection. It's, it's going to augment um, what you're already doing with with field testing. Okay. Um, sorry. Let me add just one thing there to that. One of the major drivers for us using the markers is that we don't have good assays for these the diseases that we were testing for. So at least I don't in Oregon. And um, you know, if you're for for example, if you take fusarium, um, two races that you can screen markers for, and generally you don't know in in a specific location what race you have. So it provides a way to to, to obtain both those resistances. Whereas you, you wouldn't necessarily know that information if you were screening in the field. Okay. A um, couple more questions. Are the plants in the greenhouse this winter going to be selfed or crossed? Um, the plants that are growing right now are, are selfing. Just we're allowing them to self naturally. And I think at this point, and unless we, well, I think at this point everything will be selfed uh, going towards homozygosity. Okay. Um, let's see. We've used several hybrids with desired traits and crossed them with heirlooms. The F2, of course, has a lot of variation, but can this practice cut down some work compared to just crossing OP varieties? Okay. Um, yeah, you would have less variation if you made a cross between an OP and an heirloom. No, I think it's between... Uh, oh, Oh, okay. I guess he's wondering about. He's he's crossed several hybrids with heirlooms, and he's mm -hmm. wondering about that versus just crossing OP varieties. Yeah. Well, it. Both of them are going to give you lots of variation to work with. Um, maybe even more in an in F1 by a. By an heirloom type. Um, I don't. You know, it depends on what your objectives are. If you're looking for a particular market class and you you're wanting to restrict traits to you know a certain size and color and and so forth, then the OP cross might be better than the F1 cross, um, where you have more gen more variation and more genes to be selecting among. Okay. And yeah, I don't know if anybody else wants to jump in on that. That's my thought. Okay, I think we have time for one more question here. Are you marker testing seeds, seedlings, or mature plants? It was um, seedlings, and so the 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 idea there was again just um, since these were getting advanced in the winter greenhouse, uh, we were able to uh, start with uh, you know basically you know 92 seedlings from a given Cross. Um, these were all F2 seedlings, and we didn't have room necessarily in the greenhouse, or certainly next year, to be growing out um, 92. Um, in, we didn't have room in the greenhouse to grow 92 two plants from each cross all the way to you know maturity and save seed from them, and certainly didn't have room next year to be able to um, grow 92 families from each of these crosses. So we were able to take. Um, you know, leaf punches of those seedlings, and then narrow it down from, you know, 92 plants per cross to, you know, two or three or four or five um, uh, plants that were then potted up. The other thing I would add is this company can do s seeds, but the disadvantage to doing seeds is that it's a destructive test, and uh, so you wouldn't, you know, if you have a family and you're testing a few individuals in that family then seeds might be a more direct way to go. But in our case, we were interested in saving the seedlings, so doing the leaf punches was a better way to go. Okay, well, we are running out of time, so I'd like to thank everyone for all those questions and also remind you that on March 30th, um, members of this team are giving another webinar on using biofungicides, biostimulants, and biofertilizers to boost crop 
productivity and help manage vegetable diseases. So you are certainly welcome to attend that free webinar and you can find it at the link on the top of your screen there on the page with all of our upcoming and all of our archived webinars. And there's many webinars there that I know Jerry and Jared and Lori have participated in on the whole process of seed saving and production. So if you have questions about that, that's a great place to look. And um, I'd just like to thank Julie, Lori, and Lori, Jared, Dan, and Jim for sharing this research with us. And thanks to everyone for joining us.